and I think we're here. We're all set to go. And um, it's good to see you, Corey. Great to see you as well. And um, since since we're here in in uh, COVID land and lockdown and all those kinds of things, this this is kind of what most of us have been doing a lot. So cheers. Cheers. Absolutely. What are you drinking? Uh, this is um, this is called um, Mad Tom IPA. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's got a little bit of a an o, an OT story, I think, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does indeed. It's got a bit of a principal cello aspect to it. <laughs> I think they actually do. They, at one time, I'm not making this up. They made a, I think it was a brief time. They made a one called the Even Matter Tom. Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah. You, so, I think you can still get it. It's. Oh, it's, can you? Yeah, and it, it, it's so mad that I can only have one. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the principal cellist in traffic on the way to the rehearsal. Area. <laughs> well, I think there was also a little bit of horn going on in there too. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt of that. <laughs> well, uh, so. Uh, have you been have you been getting through this period over the past three months? Well, probably like the rest of us, it's uh, it hasn't been easy. You know, like you, like any any performing musician. I mean, the work just poof, it's just gone. You know, um, although you know, and not to uh, you have two daughters yourself. I mean, I have two two young daughters as well, fifteen and and seven. So there's a plus side to it. You get more time at home. You can spend more time. Uh, with the family uh it's not as much free time as i would like actually because especially with the seven-year-old got a lot of homeschooling stuff to do so it's a fairly busy day but a lot of practicing and sort of a lot of exploration on the instrument i mean normally like you right i mean we kind of run from gig to gig to gig to gig all the time so it's kind of nice to actually just have some time to sort of it's almost like going back 20 years back to the student days when you could kind of steep in what you and what we do right so I don't know. Aside from the financial worries, I actually kind of don't mind some aspects of it. I like, I like having more time with the instrument, more time with my thoughts with the instrument. You know, I like to think I've come out of this probably several steps ahead of where I would have been had I just been, you know, doing what we usually do, which is on a, a heck of a busy treadmill. Well, also you've put out a series of videos about really the basics about right. violin technique and you've really gone into things like um, vibrato and scales and, and uh, galamian exercises and everything in a very um, scientific way almost. And, uh, but everything is broken right down into small bites. And I know that you've been working with the, uh, with the first violins and working on some repertoire for next season and all those kinds of things. So you've been very active that way. Yes, it's well, that aspect has been fantastic as well. And and again, you know, um, for example, doing Zoom, we, we have to kind of, uh, it's like a tennis match, you know, one person speaks, the other person speaks, you can't do things simultaneously. But the sectionals, I actually think it's been a bit of a positive, because we get a chance to, uh, in a more concentrated form, you know, we, we can work on a few bars, and we can hear what everybody is doing and kind of go in turn. So I mean, of course, this isn't ideal, but it hasn't been bad. And and as for doing the videos, um, I use them for my students for for OT and a few few other projects because I'm offering up these to some of the schools in York region where I live, and uh, it's something I've wanted to do for a while. So it's kind of been a little bit of a kick, a little bit of an impetus to to do that and just put. Some, I mean, nothing ex extensive. There's so much material out there, but sometimes it's nice just to put things in a a more simplified and concentrated form on a specific issue. So uh, actually, I've enjoyed doing it. And as I said, it's kind of made me have to reflect a little bit more on stuff that I do. And it's something, again, I've wanted to do for a while. So I get to sort of just focus on, on, on my instrument and focus on what I do a little bit more than what we normally have the opportunity to. So there's definitely some positive aspects to the current time. I think that there are lots of positive aspects, but I think probably the best way of looking at it that I've heard is if people are available or able to treat this period before getting back into work, and that could happen much sooner than we think, as being, is using it for reflection and trying to think about how would we, how can we do things differently? You know, one thing that I found to be really interesting is I read this um, this series of blogs every day. It's called Slip Disc, done by Norman Lebrecht. Yes, I read those as you well. Know, 
Yeah, yeah, lots of people do. And in fact, I found out today that he's got 3 million subscribers. Yeah, it's incredible. So during the, the pandemic, apparently that's gone up by 25% his readership. Wow. But because of the analytics that you can do, um, he's found out that actually the age, over 50% of the readers of slip, slip Discs are under the age of 35. That's fantastic. It's fantastic, but it also makes you think, you know, um, why aren't we seeing those people in the concert hall? What, what's, you know, what are we doing or what should we be doing differently um, to, to, to just, because this is, there's an audience there. Yes. I, I agree with you. I think it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, it's something I've talked about with some of our colleagues over the past several years, because you see a lot of, um, a lot of initiatives, you know, there'll be, uh, pops concerts that are designed to try and get people in playing pop music. And they think that that sort of draws people in and it might, you know, if there's a specific theme or a movie or whatever it might be, it's a great idea. It gets people in, but it doesn't necessarily bring people in long-term. And as you say, there is an audience out there. So trying to tap into them, but I think the audience, especially the under 35 one, they're just, they're so into this stuff right now. This, I think this speaks to them in a much greater way. So I don't know, maybe, maybe going forward, I, I sort of wonder a little bit too, as, as we reopen and hopefully, as you say, sooner than later, if some sort of hybrid system of being able to reach people might not be one of the benefits that comes out of all of this. So, you know, for example, you, you do your live concert because of course, you know, that's, that's the heart and soul of what we do. It's the heart and soul of being a human being for heaven's sake. Um, but, you know, if somebody can't make it, somebody's ill or somebody's uh, elsewhere or whatever, why couldn't they join us? You know, why couldn't they join us in a rehearsal by virtual, you know, it takes nothing to stream or why couldn't the concert be streamed to people who are less able to come and, you know, whether they're under 35 or whether they're over. So lots of possibilities. Lots of possibilities. Absolutely. Um, Corey, since I have you here and we're going to be, we're supposed to be talking about the role of the concert master. <laughs> uh, and, and for anybody who's tuning into our conversation and doesn't realize this, <laughs> you are the concert master among other places of Orchestra Toronto. And um, I've got a whole series of questions that have been sent in. And I'm just going to start from the very top. Okay. And the first one is that what people usually see when they come to a concert or, or when they watch a concert is the concert master comes out and bows and asks the oboist to give an A. And then they're supposed to clap for the concert master and then, and then that's it. But they don't really realize what a concert master does. What are some of the things that you do? Well, um, actually, even the procedure that you just outlined, it's not really about the concert master. I mean, when, when the concert master comes out and bows, it's really the concert master symbolizes the, the orchestra for a moment before the, you know, the conductor comes out to, to, to really initiate the concert. Uh, but it's a formality. Um, as historically, the concert master is the master of the concert. They're sort of like the master of ceremonies. They come out and they they kind of get the whole thing started. Um, the tuning with the oboe is very important. We have to have a common common ground that we can all agree on. Um, so somebody has to start it. Might as well be might as well be me, I suppose, or the concert master. Uh, but more than that, it's just it it is a it's steeped in tradition. I mean, the concert master, I think long time ago often would have been the one directing the concert at the same time when orchestras were smaller and simpler and the music wasn't perhaps quite so complex and, and needing you know somebody with a, a lot more abilities to direct such a disparate set of sounds and and, and colors from such a large number of people um so yeah i i think that's really uh that's what we do i mean on the surface of it what the audience sees what the audience doesn't see though is that i'm concert master i'm your i'm sort of the go-between i mean people like yourself it's it, it's a pleasure and it's very easy because you already know so much about string writing and everything else and, and string technique but sometimes some of the people might not you know in the in the speed of a rehearsal or something like that somebody at the back might be wondering as you ask for something how to do something so my job is to sort of facilitate that and try to help guide that along and, but not get in your way which is also i think a very tricky thing to do. Sometimes it's easy for a concert master to uh, say too much. So it's sort of the art, the art of knowing when to say something, how you can say it as economically as possible and no, try to not disrupt the flow of 
of rehearsal or get, get in your way? I think that it, it's always a bit of a dance rehearsals, you know, Absolutely. because at the same, by the same token, it's really easy for a conductor to say too much. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you don't, if the world was perfect, <clears throat> nobody would have to say anything. But <laughs> that's just the way it is. <laughs> well, sometimes some people might be a little bit buried in their part, not necessarily paying as much attention. So, yeah, yeah. sometimes it takes something. But you're amazing for that. So that's very easy. I think sometimes, too, my job also on a, on a more sort of philosophical plane is the, it, I don't serve any practical purpose in what I'm about to say, but you know, there's sort of a focus for the orchestra. There's somebody, one of one of the musicians, one of the rank and file, that's sort of like if somebody has an issue or has a problem, it's not uncommon for them to come and talk to me. Or they might talk to their principal player. So the principal players have somebody to blame. I mean, they have somebody to talk to. Um, and, you know, there's sort of a, a focus for that. Um, I think that's a little bit of it as well. Sort of a jack of all trades, you know, do a little bit of dabbling in this and that. And, and I remember once somebody asked me this um a little while ago about a concert master and I said my job is actually to make your the best description I can think of is my job is to make your job easier that's what a concert master's job really is whether it's in rehearsal whether it's off stage whether it's on stage whether it's backstage that's the role of a concert master yeah it's really interesting because I have to say from my perspective that uh, that I, 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 a fine concert master makes all the difference in the way the work goes and it, you can save so much time <laughs> just by having a really expert concert master like you there that makes things Fine, but... go and, and uh, helps. The, I think that the other thing that um, a lot of people don't realize that aren't musicians or sometimes people who aren't string players uh, don't realize how important bowings are. Mm. And there's a real art to this, isn't there? Well, there is. And it's actually much more, I mean, on the surface of it, sometimes we sort of self-deprecatingly will say, well, you only got two choices. You're down or you're up, figure it out. But it's, as you say, it's a lot more involved than that. It's more like a chess match. You have to think about a hundred or sometimes a thousand moves ahead and think about where you need to be. So if we have a particular stroke or a particular sound you have in mind, that might dictate where we need to be in the bow. Then you have to think about, okay, how can we get there? Because you can't suddenly just, you know, magically appear well sometimes you can but so the boeings and also having a boeing that boeings that take into account the needs of uh the conductor the needs of the section and sometimes just the needs of all the string players because there are things you might like to do and maybe you know that so it's a question of whether or not people can do it but people might be opposed to it or they might look at it differently so you try to find boeings that will try and satisfy all of that and of course we have to be homogenous i mean we can't be milking cows visually but more importantly then we're getting different sounds we're getting different timbres different articulations that will let the cows take care of themselves for an, <laughs> for an utter bowing but uh i'd lose my job if i didn't use that one uh but seriously you, you it we have to be lockstep so that we all have a unanimous a unanimous vision and part of that's visual too because a lot of the leading if you know the section at the back might not be able to always see you or feel what's going on. So there's also just the, the physicality of the Boeings, the physicality of that environment and playing. So that again, we, we try to come up with a homogenous vision of how to come together with you, with everybody else. It's also interesting when you see, for example, videos w with uh, Leopold Stokowski, who was really interested in trying different things out. He was very unorthodox and he liked a lot using a lot of free Boeings. Yes. Uh, and he felt that that gave this really warm sound uh, and a little bit more power. Um, we don't do that too much these days. Uh, have you seen that too much, very much? No, I, I, in fact, I, I, if anything, it's interesting you bring that up. I think that sometimes you almost see quite the opposite. Like it seems to get more and more and more heavily regimented maybe to a fault. I mean, we all, I think a section, I don't know how you feel. We probably have the same idea. I definitely think a section should be doing the same thing. I don't think, you know, as our ideas too have changed so much, right? I mean, our interpretation, especially of slightly older music, we, we have different ideas than perhaps in Stokowski's time about how the strings would have articulated or the, the, the texture. So different demands.
Yeah, I think that uh, this all ha goes hand in hand with the uh, original instruments movement as well. Not that people did this kind of thing back in the time of Mozart or early Beethoven, because I, I think it wasn't until Spohr really and people like Mendelssohn who really were interested in doing uniform bowings. Right. Right. But, but uh, it, there's this understanding or wish to be as exact as possible. And I think it's also in our mentality nowadays. Absolutely. But also, I mean, the, their orchestras, of course, would have been a lot smaller. And even when we do slightly reduce to do some of that music, we're still kind of on the, the large side, right? We're still sort of engorged. So they could probably get away with a little bit more freedom just because it's more transparent texture. And of course, we have a much thicker, heavier sound to deal with. So it makes some sense. Although, you know, there are times when if the violas or the cellos or the bass, well, I don't even worry about the bass, it's not kidding. Um, if somebody says that, you know, it's a bowing that we're doing doesn't particularly work for them, okay, so don't do it. You know, as long as we're getting the same, we're coming at it differently, it's a different weight, it's a different articulation, it's a different sound way of getting the sound out of the instrument, so they need to know how best to accommodate that. As long as we have the same idea coming from you, trickling down, and you know, as long as the section is unanimous. So it's interesting how that sort of goes. Often the principals, even at OT or other orchestras, will say, well, you know, that really doesn't work. Okay, well, then don't do it. You know, as long as it's the same sound, I'm fine with that. I've got another question here that was sent in um, that, because you're, you're, also, you're a very prolific soloist and chamber musician, and you um, play concert master with many orchestras. Mm -hmm. um, the, the question is, do you ever get nervous? And if you do, do you have something, some, some ways of dealing with it? Uh, in all honesty, I get nervous pretty much all the time, sometimes even in rehearsals. And there's some things, is, okay, so it, it sort of separates into different sorts of categories in my mind. The hamster in my mind goes down different treadmills depending what's going on. So if it's a solo concerto, there's obviously a lot of advanced preparation for that. So I might be nervous, but a better way of explaining it, I get very excited. So I'll prepare as much ahead of time. So I have some stuff that hopefully is taking place in the fall. And I began about three or four months ago. So I'll do a little bit here, a little bit there, and you just sort of get a nice foundation for things. So when those things come up, I might be very nervous, but it's probably more excitement and anticipation. If so, there are times when I'll get nervous, either in, um, you know, some when more when unexpected things happen. But again, I think it's like almost any profession, the more you are prepared for any emergency, then when things come up, you don't think about it so much in the moment, you just kind of deal with it. And then afterwards, you realize, wow, heart was going pretty fast at that point. <laughs> so I, I like to try and be as prepared as much as possible. And I like to try to keep the enamel on my teeth. So uh, I, I prepare as much as I can ahead of time. Uh, but I do get, uh, there are times when I get nervous and uh, I work on having a good poker face as much as possible. Well, you're surprising me because I've never ever thought that you ever got nervous. I, that was my own personal feeling. <laughs> well, good. Well, we should play cards then. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would lose. <laughs> oh, not necessarily. <laughs> Well, I have a terrible problem with nerves, um, and it, it, it's, it doesn't get easier the older I get. <laughs> well, actually, that surprises me. I wouldn't have guessed that. And how do, you, how, how do you deal with that, then? How do you cope? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's basically, I have to agree with you, the, the more prepared I feel that I am, the easier it is. Uh, the problem is that when you're a conductor, you don't have an instrument at home to work mm -hmm. on. It's right. all in your head. And so what I have to do is it's really a, a head game. And I try to make sure I have as many things as possible to go into. Because the, the first rehearsal is really terrible for me um, because I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm worried about me messing up and making it terrible for 85 to 100 different people. 
Well, and you're amazing because I've I've yet to witness that. So that's not been our the, the, the There's a lot of angst that goes on before walking into that room. <laughs> but but and concerts not so much because concerts by that time we've worked together and and I feel that we're just all big a part of a big team and so you know it's a matter of me giving making things sure things happen and of course the heart races at that moment but then once we're going we're going but yeah i think it really it's the spending the time with the art that's what probably is the best thing to do and i don't think there's any other way around it but you know a, a conductor like yourself i mean you you have a very different pressure you're responsible for as you say 85 people i'm not responsible for 80 well indirectly i don't have that kind of i'm not making the call on any of that stuff so that's why i say i think a concert master's job is i'm supposed to make your job easier you have a lot more to deal with you don't need to be dealing with silly stuff you don't need to be you don't need to be quite wondering whether or not um you know we've got your back because that's my job i'm i i i have your back that is the i think the very definition of what a concert master needs to do because that way, you're, then I try to free you up that you can actually create something, and then we all go off together. I think we're ready for the next question. Um, I'm just skipping around here because we've really covered some of the questions that have come in. Um, sure. But I, let's talk about OT, Orchestra Toronto, a little okay. bit. And, and a lot of people, um, this has happened since the first second I walked in there, and it continues until this day. We all like to talk about why we feel Orchestra Toronto is special, and we all have our own reasons. I'm just wondering what your reasons are. Well, you know, it's interesting because Orchestra Toronto is probably one of the best orchestras of its genre, of its type, I think, around. Certainly in the GTA, um, and maybe even much farther afield. And I think it's a combination of things without sounding disparaging of, of my profession, full-time professionally paid colleagues elsewhere. Um, everybody at orchestra Toronto is there because they want to be there. They're there because they have a passion. They feel a need for it and they feel a need to share that with other people. It's like, it's the purest of motives, right? They are there for all the right reasons. Uh, the professionals like yourself, the other principals, myself, Sure, we're paid for it, but you kind of, I find myself kind of feeding off of that. There's almost like a wonderment, you know, and again, it's, it's not that there's something bad about the other stuff when I'm in a, in a, I hate the word professional orchestra. I think it's a real bad label, but for lack of a better term, a fully paid orchestra is probably a better way of putting it. Um, it's not that they're jaded, but maybe a little bit, you know, there's not that sense of wonderment as they tackle Beethoven's ninth and you know you hear some of those chords and some of those harmonies at the outset of the last movement and you can just tell everybody you can just feel the ramped up excitement from the people around us kind of like that I mean I think that's that's what we should be in it for you know so in a strange way I think an orchestra like Orchestra Toronto carries the torch for what orchestra music is supposed to be about not the fully paid orchestras you know they might be a little bit more polished might have bigger budgets to be able to pull off some of that stuff but in terms of excitement i don't know where you're going to find something more by the seat of your pants on edge kind of you know passionate you can see people really getting into it so that's why i like being there i think it's that's that's the the purest uh, strongest aspect that keeps me there how about how about you well you've just you've said exactly the things that go on with me. I mean, the, the thing that, that struck me was I saw this quote on Orchestra Toronto's material for the love of it or for the love of music or whatever it is, and, or making music for the love of it. Music for the love of it, I think that's what it is. <clears throat> and, and it really was very apparent to me, uh, really strong. It hit me between the eyes that this, this is why we do this. Um, music is not something that you do in order to have a really comfortable and, and a comfortable life that's going to be full of money and you can't just, you know, do what, what you want. Music is, is really, it's something that chooses you. It's, it's a vocation. It's like becoming a priest in a way. Um, you don't decide to be a priest 
the, the priesthood chooses you, I'm, I guess, I, I hope. Um, and certainly that's the way it is in, in music. And we lose sight of that so easily. And then when we're in a place like Orchestra Toronto, which is completely magical, all of that just gets repeated. And the fact that we get to do this once a week is, is just, it's a lifesaver. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, there's, because there's got to be a reason we're in it. As you said, it's the purest of motives, right? It's just for the sheer joy of it. No matter what happens, no matter who's there, no matter how many are there. Yeah, that's, that's what we're there for. Yeah, I love that part. Yeah. Now, Corey, um, what we, we all want to know is if you have some favorite music. It doesn't have to be symphonic or orchestral or favorite pieces or favorite composers. What do you like to listen to or play? What are your favorite things? So, well, I am a kind of a violin nerd in that respect. So things that with me tend to be string centric. Favorite unaccompanied works, any of the solo Bach. Favorite chamber music? Um, probably Brahms piano trios, any of those, especially the B major. I don't know how many times I've played it. Still get chills up and down my spine every time I play that opening or hear that opening. You know, listen to the cellist play and I'm transported. Actually, I have to make sure I'm always paying attention because after hearing the opening cello melody of that, I might just not come in because I'm just lost. Um, favorite violin concerto? Probably Beethoven. And symphonic work? God, I don't know. Any of the Brahms symphonies, I suppose. Love Stravinsky. Some of the big yeah. Stravinsky writing. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of my my hit list. But if I had to pick a favorite composer out of anybody, it'd have to be Bach. I think it all begins and ends with that guy. Yeah, he's the he's the, exactly he's the fountain. And the, the the thing that's unfortunate for me as a conductor is that we usually have to specialize if we're going to be doing Bach. We have to be specializing in that. In, in Baroque practice now, it's become very ghettoized. And we don't get a chance to do as much Bach as, <clears throat> as once was possible, I don't think. Um, but that's, that's, you know, I, I'm a, I, one of the things I do is play the, the organ, the, the, as you know, and uh, that's luckily one of my outlets is that I get to, to do some trio sonatas and different things like that. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, Bach was the reason I got into music in the first place. Oh yeah, even as a trombonist. Well, I wasn't playing the trombone yet. I was a I was a kid, and I visited my grandfather, uh, who lived in the area in Hamilton, and he was a music lover. And I would go over there on Sunday afternoons and just listen to music with him because I was be, had piano lessons from when I was young, and he would play me things. And and he he and my my grandparents had just come back from a trip to Europe and. Um, they had been to uh, Rome and he had some pictures of, of the Basilica. And so he showed me the dub Bernini at the same time, the bugger put on a recording of the Bach St. Matthew Passion, the very beginning, uh, you know, that, yeah. that kind of thing. And then when the choir comes in, you know, I all of a sudden, it was, it was like having an out of body experience because I saw that dub of Bernini, I heard that music and it, everything, the universe at that moment for maybe a split second made sense. Then you had a much better <laughs> making more sense than the rest of us have ever since. That's for sure. I get it though. I, I totally agree. There's just something, there's a depth to it that is impossible to explain with that guy. Yeah. And it's all encompassing. Yeah. And talk about somebody who was busy. <laughs> yeah, How did he, that one out. I know. It, 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 starting from seven o'clock in the morning, teaching, preparing three churches uh, with their orchestras. And, and, oh, it's just wild. He had apparently a uh, copyist set up in their house that he would write things, the, the cantata for the next week, and the copyist would have to just write all the time. He had about five people working for him around the clock. I didn't even know that. Well, he, there must have been a lot of bald birds in the area with all the quills getting <laughs> <laughs> Any chickens in the area? Nope, they all left town. Why? Fox <laughs> writing something. <laughs> One final question for you, Corey, before we finish. Um, do you have any interests outside of music? I'm a car freak. 
I love cars. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, that's sort of my, my outside of music passion. So I've had, uh, I've had Mustangs now for over 20 years. So I'm on my one, two, I'm on my third one and counting probably. So yeah, I love driving. Don't do anything silly, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I love cars, anything to do with, with cars. And I'm all over that. Huh. So that's my, that's my thing. My seven-year-old daughter is totally into that too. Wow. I also have an electric car. So she's, she helps me detail the engines and she knows all about the displacement and the, you know, sure how to shift the, uh, the manual. Cause that's the way God intended it when he built cars, uh, in the Mustang. So she knows how to shift. She knows how a clutch works, all that stuff. It's kind of cool. So anything, my older daughter couldn't care less. My wife couldn't care less. But, uh, you know, tradition will live on in my seven-year-old, I think. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope. Uh, the, uh, there's probably no secret to you, or for, to most people, actually. My, my passion is coffee. Yes. Um, and uh, I've actually trained my older daughter to, to be a home barista just like me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I am planning to do a video um, uh, at some point in the next few weeks of how to make a, a, a cappuccino at home. You, you could do. You could pull a, a Seinfeld conductors in, a, a, at home. A, conductors in a cafe making coffee, but without the comedian part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. We have a pretty good time, I think. <laughs> Corey, it's it's a great pleasure to talk to you as always. Oh, likewise, my friend. Thank you so much for inviting me in. And I'm really looking forward. Um, I'm just making a plug because this will be available before this happens. Of the. Uh, concert that you and, and Tom and Richard Harriet are going to be putting on for Orchestra Toronto, in, including the Shostakovich Trio yeah, and some Bach. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Well, Tom, uh, Tom's fantastic. I mean, I don't know if you ever hear that guy warming up. I don't know if he's ever opened a copy of Bach in his life. He just seems to have them all like somewhere in his DNA. So yeah, looking forward to it. And Richard's amazing and, and the Shostakovich is fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to this. It'll be nice to play uh, with somebody actually instead of just over the internet <laughs> yes this is going to be actu actually three people playing in the same room this is that's right historic <laughs> yes with nobody coming in and, and telling us to get out yeah it's gonna be amazing well <laughs> yeah <yet> anyway <laughs> we'll have to see thanks again Corey. thanks my friend take we'll, care we'll talk soon okay okay bye Ciao.